Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to another video of the Prophet Muhammad in the Bible, as well as uh, a prophecy here which we're looking at, which proves that Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, and so this is going to be a much more in-depth breakdown of Isaiah 21, including speaking about what the original reading is that you may have seen before. So let's look at that. Isaiah 21, describing a punishment on Babylon. Then it describes that a watchman is goes to take station and he declares what he sees. And what he sees is, uh, and I saw two mounted horsemen and a rider on a donkey and a rider on a camel. Now the first thing to point out here is that in the versions you may have, in the Masoretic uh, versions that you may have, uh, Bible translations based on the Masoretic scribes, it would probably say, and I saw two mounted horsemen and riders on donkeys and riders on camels, or chariots of riders on donkey, donkeys and chariots of riders on camels. But actually, this is a later corrupted version. The actual original reading is in the singular that he saw a single rider on a donkey and a single rider on a camel. As John C. Reeves here points out that the ancient versions of the Tanakh all have this reading in the singular, in including the Greek, Latin, Syriac, and Aramaic versions, all of which are before the Masoretic version, as well as the Isaiah scroll. So the Dead Sea Scrolls, Isaiah scroll is in the singular as well. And early Jewish and Muslim quotations are all also mentioned this as being about a single rider on a donkey and a single rider on a camel. And the Muslim scholars that were quoting this also say that the Christians read this, uh, the donkey rider here, as being a, a reference to Jesus. So that also shows us that Christians were reading this in the singular as well. And that is the reading of the Septuagint. So that's why I've chosen the Septuagint translation here because the Masoretic scribes uh, version that you have is a corrupted version. The original ver version said a single rider on a donkey and a single rider on a camel. And John C. Reeves here actually suggests that the uh, Masoretic scribes, they corrupted the text uh, because it was being read as being a reference to the Messiah and as a reference to the Prophet Muhammad. So they corrupted it to get out of this Muslim argument that here the Prophet Muhammad is in the Bible. Shana Anthony also here confirms that uh, the reading in the Isaiah scrolls or the Dead Sea scrolls as well as the Septuagint, Peshitta, Vulgate, etc. is all in the singular unlike the Masoretic text. So it's quite clear that the Masoretic text is a later corrupted version. It does not agree with the earliest versions as well as early Jewish and Muslim quotations of the text. So getting the reading out of the way, now let's start identifying who these people are. Who are the two mounted horsemen and the rider on the donkey and the rider on the camel? Well, the two mounted horsemen are quite obviously Cyrus and Darius, as the Benson commentary points out. The common reading is that the two horsemen are Cyrus and Darius. And we see in Isaiah 45, describing the first destruction of Babylon, that God was going to send his anointed, his Messiah Cyrus, to basically uh, free the Jews and uh, uh, allow the Jews to come back. And basically, the, uh, Cyrus is the one who is going to take over Babylon. Um, as I said, uh, Raji points out, Isaiah 45 is speaking about uh, Cyrus saving, uh, saving the Jews and, and punishing Babylon, right? And then Darius is, of course, the person, according to the Bible, who took over after the king of Babylon died. So after he was slain, Darius the Mede took over the kingdom. When the, when the kingdom of Babylon was divided, it went to the Medes and the Persians, and the ruler was Darius, according to Daniel 5. So these are the two that are the mounted horsemen, because the Bible describes one punishment on Babylon, and it's done by Cyrus, and then the uh, Darius is the one who takes over the kingdom. So th those are the two that are most well known for the destruction on Babylon. And that is the common reading as the Benson commentaries already pointed out. As uh, you see, Darius the Mede here is uh, the king of Babylon between uh, Belshazzar and Cyrus the Great. Babylon here is mentioned, but uh, of course, uh, after Babylon, Di Darius and Cyrus were uh, the rulers, the Persian and Mede rulers. Right. And we see the Bible frequently mentions these two together, Daniel 6. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian, Ezra 4, 5, and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. 
and Josephus in Antiquities of the Jews. And this is the account I had to give of the Jews who had been carried into captivity, but were delivered from it in the times of Cyrus and Darius, describing how the Jews were saved from Babylon because of Cyrus and Darius. So it's quite obvious these two are the uh, two horsemen. So that's a pretty easy identification when we see what the Bible says about Babylon's destruction and the two men it highlights. But what you'll notice is it's not so easy to determine who the rider on the donkey is and the rider on a camel if you think that only the first destruction of Babylon is being described here. Because the Bible des describes one destruction of Babylon that happens to Cyrus and Darius. You know, traditionally, w when they allowed for the temple to be rebuilt, the first temple to be rebuilt, uh, the building of the second temple, right? But in this uh, destruction of Babylon, two people come to mind, but here we have four people described. Riders, two riders on horses, as well as a rider on a donkey and a rider on a camel. Those two, there's not a clear identification if you think about the first uh, destruction of Babylon. So how can we fill these two in? Well, all you have to realize is the Bible actually speaks about the second destruction of Babylon as well. This happens in Habakkuk 1. Basically, Habakkuk uh, prays to God about, you know, ju the Jewish people being, um, you know, uh, oppressed. And then God says, I'm, I'm going to send the Babylons, the Babylonians, sorry. Uh, and they're going to do the work for me. And then Habakkuk complains that why are you sending, you know, these evil people? And then God basically responds by saying, okay, I'm going to destroy Babylon as well. Right? And uh, Habakkuk says, I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he, meaning God, will say to me and what answer I've given to this complaint. And God basically answers by saying, okay, I will destroy Babylon as well. And as you see here, Rashi points out, that this is describing, uh, Habakkuk 2 is describing Babylon's punishment, uh, and as well as the enduring word commentary, it's about Babylon's punishment. And then Habakkuk, how, well, how does he uh, interpret all this? What God speaks, when God speaks to Habakkuk and says, okay, I'll destroy, uh, destroy Babylon as well, how does Habakkuk interpret this? Well, that is given to us in chapter 3, which is the response of Habakkuk to what God uh, tells him about how he's going to punish the Babylonians. And Habakkuk basically says, Lord, I've heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. God will come from the south, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth. And then it goes on to describe how many nations are being punished militarily. Right? Uh, I saw, uh, or he stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. I saw the tents of Christian in distress, the dwellings of Midian in anguish. Were you angry with the rivers, Lord? Was your wrath against the stream? Did you rage against the sea when you rode on horses and your chariots to victory? You uncovered your bow. You called for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers, etc. So describing how then God will punish many nations militarily. Okay, now think about this. This is how Habakkuk uh, interprets God telling him that Babylon is going to be destroyed. By mentioning how God is going to be coming from the south, going to be coming from Mount Paran, which we know is a reference to Arabia. So when did God come from Arabia and his whole glory covered the earth and the knowledge of God basically covered the earth and he punished many nations militarily? Well, that did not happen with Cyrus and Darius's destruction of Babylon. That, uh, those two did not come from Arabia. The knowledge of God did not cover the earth, right? His praise did not fill the earth, and they did not punish many nations militarily through the aid of God. Only Babylon was through the aid of God, essentially, in, in the way it's portrayed here. And Habakkuk 2 also mentions that uh, basically the glory of God, is, or the knowledge of God will be, uh, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. That did not happen with Cyrus and Darius's destruction though so Habakkuk 3 is uh, Habakkuk 2 and 3 is describing a second disruption of Babylon which is going to happen when God will come from Arabia right so uh, in pulpit's commentary on uh, they point out that verse 3 which you see here says God came from Taman the holy one from Mount Paran right now you read this it's in the past tense but actually 
this commentary points out, it's actually in the future tense. So it's been mistranslated in the past tense. And uh, Ellicott's commentary for English readers also says the same thing. In the Hebrew, some of these words are in the future tense and some others uh, in other tenses. And they explain this as being an obvious prophetic perfect tense, which basically means sometimes past tense is used uh, in the Bible for prophecies because the idea is it's a literary technique. It means, oh, it's so assuredly going to happen that it's spoken of as if it's already happened. But the fact that there are clear verbs that are in the future tense proves it's a prophecy of the future. So it's been mistranslated here as God came from Taman. It should say God will come from Taman, the Holy One from Mount Paran, as they've translated it here. God shall come from Taman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. Okay? His glory covers the heaven and the earth is full of his praise. So it, this is a future event, right? And also, if you read what it's actually saying, we know it's future because uh, God, you know, the whole, uh, the glory and knowledge, etc. of God did not cover the whole earth when it was just Israel, right? So it's obviously speaking about a future event. Now, Taman, what is Taman? As Matthew Poole's commentary here points out, Taman is either a reference to the south, because Taman just means south, or it could mean a proper name, which would be referring to probably Edom the area of Edom. So this could be translated as God will come from the south, the Holy One from Mount Paran, or God will come from Taman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. And if you go to uh, the Aramaic Bible, so here, uh, as well as this other translation, they both translate it as, as God will come from the south, or God came from the south. So Taman can be either a reference to south in general, or uh, Taman, uh, probably being a reference to Edom. If you go to Deuteronomy 33, 2, you find the same thing being mentioned. The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Sire unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. So if you notice here, uh, imagery is being used with the sun. So God came from Sinai. Then he rose up from Sire. So in the Hebrew here, it actually means like how the sun rises up from Seir and shine forth from Mount Paran. So now the sun has reached its peak. So the peak of the revelation is going to come from Mount Paran. When the revelation, when God came from Sinai, which is the handing down of the Torah, God has just appeared from Sinai. Then he will rise up from Seir. So the sun gets brighter. Now it's, it's dawn time, and uh, after dawn. I should say it's after dawn, right? When the sun is rising up. Then when it's fully shining, that's when God's going to come from Paran. And he will come with 10,000 of saints, and it's from his right hand will come a fiery law for them. You see, it's a parallel to Habakkuk. And because we know Habakkuk 3.3 is in the future tense, honestly, this is also a future prophecy because it's saying the same thing. So how should we expect God to come from Sire and Mount Paran? Well, the same way he came from Sinai. How did he come from Sinai? Well, with the prophethood of Moses and the handing down of the Torah. Now, Sire here might be a reference to Edom in general. Or it might be a reference to Mount Sire, which we see mentioned in Joshua 15, and is probably here, which is very close to Bethlehem, which is where Jesus came from. And uh, you'll notice here, uh, Joshua 15.10 uses Mount Sire as a landmark. So at that time, the Jews, you know, when, when Moses was there, the Jews didn't know of Jerusalem. They didn't know the places there. So Mount Sire they knew, which is why it was used as a landmark, it seems, in Deuteronomy 33, 2. So they didn't know any of the places, any of the mountains in Jerusalem at that time. So Mount Sire was used to let them know where essentially God is going to be coming up, uh, from, from Sire. Very close to Bethlehem in Jerusalem, the area where Jesus came from, right? A perfect landmark for where he came from. Um, and the reason I think Mount Sinai could be meant here is because it says God came from Sinai. Well, we know Sinai is, is Mount Sinai. That's, you know, the Torah, etc. was handed out at the Mount Sinai. And now from Paran, it says Mount Paran. So when it says Sire, it seems that it would make sense that it was, it's referring to Mount Sire. But it could also be a reference to Edom. Okay, so where's Paran? As Genesis 21 points out, Ishmael grew up in the desert of Paran. So Paran is where the Ishmaelites, the Arabs, grew up. And Rashi also says this in Habakkuk 3.3's commentary that Paran is a reference to Ishmael. 
And he quotes the verse I quoted, and all the early uh, Jewish commentaries and interpretations all read uh, Deuteronomy 33's Mount Paran as a reference to Arabia. As this paper points out, this is Sifrei Debarim. It uh, associates Mount Paran with Arabic. This is another uh, Jewish early Midrash. Also associates uh, Paran with the children of Ishmael, as well as this Midrash does the same thing. This Midrash does the same thing. Or uh, it's Perk de Rabbi Elizer, sorry. And then this Targum does the same thing. So it's very obvious the early Jews uh, understood that Mount Paran is a reference to Arabia. So God's going to be coming from Arabia. Well, ask yourself, when was Habakkuk 3, 3 fulfilled? When did God come from Arabia and the whole world knew of him and has praised filled the whole earth and he punished many nations militarily? Well, we know Islam came from Paran. And at that point, the knowledge of God, monotheism, etc., it became global and universal, right? That's when it happened, when Islam came. It's, it's the largest religion in the world today. It's even larger than Christianity because Christianity is actually, most people uh, in the West, etc., don't really even believe in it. And even then, you have half the people who are Catholics and half the people who are Protestants, both of which have, uh, you know, different sects, and many of them don't even consider each other to be believers, right? So, it only... Islam is, is the greatest, uh, largest religion in the world, and the companions of the Prophet Muhammad went around punishing many nations militarily. Okay. So, uh, let's see. Now, notice in Deuteronomy 33, 2, it also gave us some more detail, mentioning that when God comes from Paran, he will come with 10,000 saints, and from his right hand will come a fiery law for them. 10,000 10, here can be 10,000, 10, 10,000. Early English would also refer to 10,000. It's 10 thousands, right? So um, it can also mean multitudes, etc. But 10,000 is a valid translation that he will come with 10,000 of saints. And from his right hand will come a fiery law for them. And of course, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, when he opened Mecca, he had 10,000 companions with him. And he was reciting Surah Al-Fat. Uh, a surah in from the Quran and he was re reciting it so he came with 10,000 companions and the fiery law he came with was the Quran and he was specifically reciting Surah Al-Fat and he entered in on a she camel so he came on a camel okay now this book this book uh, quotes Sibius in a 7th century Armenian bishop writing that when uh, the uh, describing the Arab conquest of his time he wrote that the Arabs assembled and came out from Paran Sire, Edom, how is this a reference to the Messiah? Well, Jesus, we know, Chris, uh, Jewish Christianity, etc., it spread from that area, right? The Roman Empire, etc., and Edom was within the Roman Empire and south from there, etc., and then it even went further south to North Africa, etc., so that's basically where Christianity emerged from. Now, it wasn't as big as when God came from Arabia because Islam has uh, had more followers and also because uh, when... Uh, you know, Christianity spread, there was a lot of Trinitarianism as well uh, that spread. But really, that m there was also monotheistic understanding of Christianity. And this spread uh, for outside of Israel, right? Remember, before Jesus, the knowledge of God was within Israel alone. After Christianity, right, after Jesus, etc., monotheistic Christianity and the knowledge of God, etc., one God, etc., without Trinity, etc., it spread outside of Israel. It went to many lands as well through monotheistic Christians. And it came from uh, the Roman Empire. Uh, that's around where it spread. Then it went to many nations. And then only when God came from Arabia did the pure monotheism spread across into more places and pure monotheism. Also, we know that that Edom area, which became, you know, Jordan, etc., that area was a, a mass Christian hub. You know, there were many, you know, Christians in Jordan and Syria and in those places. So that description of Edom is actually a perfect uh, representation of, of Christianity and, you know, this Eastern Christianity. Of course, a lot of monotheistic Christianity came and spread from there. So the knowledge of God, it left Israel, went to many other nations, uh, such as that Syria area in, in North Africa, etc. And that spread happened after, uh, uh, basically, you know, the Jews and Christians, they were expelled from Israel. So only after the ex uh, expulsion from Jerusalem did, was there this more, you know, spreading of, of, of Christianity, whereas early on it was a much smaller movement. 
Also, the point of highlighting Edom is it's all connected to the promise to Abraham in Genesis 12. Because in Genesis 12, God promises that Abraham will be turned into a great nation. Now, there are three children of Abraham and three nations from Abraham. The Bible highlights the Israelites, the Edomites, who are the descendants of Esau, and the Ishmaelites, who are the Arabs. Now, the great nation promised to Abraham began to be fulfilled with Moses and the coming of the Torah. As Deuteronomy 4, Moses explains that Israel is a great nation because they keep the laws of the Torah and they're monotheistic. One side of Abraham's descendants became monotheistic. Then when monotheistic Christianity spread, it also spread uh, somewhat amongst the Edomites. So the promise to Abraham uh, began to be fulfilled more. Right now, more of his descendants knew of the knowledge of God, etc., the Ishmaelites at this point still didn't know. That only happened when God came from Paran. So then the Ishmaelites, the other descendants of Abraham. See, now you have the Israelites. You had the Edomites. Now you have the Ishmaelites as well, knowing about the knowledge of God. And in fact, when God came from Paran, that's when the promise was fully realized, not only because of the Ishmaelites, but also because now uh, the rest of Abraham's descendants became monotheistic as well, including the rest of the Israelites, because the majority of the Israelites had lost the fact that they were monotheistic. They became the ten lost tribes. They became Muslims. And the rest of the Edomites became Muslims as well. And also, if, uh, you know, uh, if it's uh, simply Deuteronomy 33 to mentioning Mount Sire, well, we saw that that's a landmark for south of Jerusalem, which works perfectly with uh, Bethlehem, Jesus coming from Bethlehem. And also Habakkuk 3 mentioning God coming from the south, being referenced to the Messiah, uh, because he came from south of Jerusalem, and that's where uh, his, you know, uh, his followers, they spread, etc. You know, south of, of that Jerusalem area. So either way, it works. But of course, it was only when God came from Paran, Arabia, Mecca, when uh, the, when God shone forth from Paran, you know, the peak of the revelation, there's another thing which proves to us that Isaiah 21 is about uh, is very closely linked with Habakkuk, and that's the fact that Habakkuk 2, when he sees the destruction of Babylon, uh, when God describes it, first Habakkuk says that I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I'm given to this complaint. So he's now standing at watch, etc., and uh, he's looking to see what will happen. And Isaiah 21 uh, f 6 or uh, says, For so has the Lord said to me, Go set up the lookout. What he sees, he will tell. And so it's quite obvious that Habakkuk is the lookout here. right? He's the one who is set up as the lookout, the one who would stand watch. And as Rashi even makes this connection, he says, One of your disciples is destined to complain about my answer, etc., etc. Et and that was Habakkuk who made a circle and stood inside it and said, Habakkuk 2 1, on my watch will I stand, and I will look out to see what he will speak within me. So, the one who is set up as the lookout was Habakkuk. As even Rashi makes the connection, it's quite obvious. Okay, So, Daniel 2 is also an interesting text. It also describes the second uh, destruction of Babylon because it mentions that basically there will be uh, many kingdoms after Babylon. And then there will be, uh, so the kingdoms after Babylon will be Medan Persia, then Greece, then Rome, and then a kingdom of God. Well, ask yourself, what was the kingdom after Rome? which was a kingdom of God. Well, it was Islam. That was historically the kingdom after Rome, and when it came, it was a kingdom of God. So, of course, that is the uh, uh, kingdom of God in Daniel, the fifth kingdom. And according to Daniel 2, it will uh, crush those other kingdoms, including Babylon. Right? It crushed those other kingdoms, meaning uh, the king uh, Rome, Greece, Babylon, and Median Persia. And, of course, Islam did that. Right? So this is describing, Daniel 2 is describing a second punishment on Babylon when the kingdom of God will do it. Well, that was not a reference to Cyrus and Darius. They were part of the Medan Persian Empire. But this is talking about a second disruption that's going to happen on Babylon when the kingdom of God comes. And we know historically that was Islam. That was the kingdom after Rome. Okay. So another thing to notice here is that Daniel 2, describing the other kingdoms, uh, basically the pagan kingdoms, right? Babylon, Medan, Persia, Greece, and Rome. He, it's, they, an imagery is given of them 
that they come together to form an idol. And then the kingdom of God is like a rock which comes and crushes the idol. So this imagery is important for us and it gives us a clue because those other kingdoms are like a big idol and the kingdom of God is like a rock which will come and crush that idol. Okay? Isaiah 21. Okay, coming back to the text. Now, with this newfound knowledge that we have that Habakkuk and... uh, What's the text here? Daniel described a second destruction on Babylon, which was not uh, fulfilled with Cyrus and Darius. We can easily identify the other two riders. So we know the two mounted horsemen was a reference to Cyrus and Darius. But we could not easily identify the rider on the donkey and the rider on a camel. But now, when we know that there is a second destruction that's happening on Babylon, from Arabia, the rider on the camel becomes obvious as the prophet Muhammad. And... The, uh, of course, again, because we know Islam was historically the fifth kingdom, that also makes it clear for us that the rider on the camel is the prophet Muhammad. We also know there are many other prophecies in the Bible which speak about a prophet coming from Arabia. So uh, here, the camel rider is an obvious reference to the prophet Muhammad, who's the prophet who historically came from Arabia. And the rider on the donkey, of course, uh, is an obvious reference to the Messiah, as Zechariah 9.9 describes. Uh, rejoice greatly, daughter Zion, shout daughter Jerusalem, see your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So who is the one who's described as a donkey rider in the Bible in Tanakh? Well, the Messiah is the only one who's described as a donkey rider in the Bible. So it's quite obvious that the rider on the donkey here is the Messiah. And if the Messiah is the rider on the donkey, well, who would be the rider on the camel? It's quite an obvious answer. And Jesus fulfilled this prophecy of Zechariah 9.9 in Luke when he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. And the people shouted, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory to God. In fact, the fact that the Messiah is going to come into Jerusalem riding in on a donkey is so famous. It's even a modern Hebrew phrase, the Messiah's donkey. And again, Prophet Muhammad, when he arrived in Mecca, in the conquest of Mecca, the opening of Mecca, at the end of his life when he cleaned it, he ar- arrived riding a she-camel, reciting Surah Al-Fat. And of course, many times he rode in on camels and she-camels, other camels as well. That is quite obvious. He was an Arab, right? Arabs being known as camel riders is more obvious than uh, the sun's brightness. Okay. Some uh, good hadith I found, which uh, also show that the donkey rider being mentioned with the camel rider is an appropriate description because the prophet Muhammad and uh, the Messiah Jesus are very close. As the prophet Muhammad said, both in this world and the hereafter, I am the nearest of all the people to Jesus, the son of Mary. The prophets are paternal brothers. Their mothers are different, but their religion is one. The prophet said, there is no prophet between me and him. That is Jesus. The description of Muhammad is written in the Torah and the description that Jesus will be buried next to him. And Abu Maudud said, and there is a place for a grave left in the house. So even in Medina today, there's a place next to where the Prophet Muhammad is buried for a grave left for Jesus to uh, be buried there when he comes back. So those two are very closely linked. And basically, Jesus, when he came, he paved the way, he paved the way for the Prophet Muhammad to come. So the two of them are very closely linked and also Jesus foretold that the Prophet Muhammad would come. So the donkey rider Jesus and the camel rider the Prophet Muhammad being mentioned together uh, makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, Jesus paving the way for the kingdom of God to come, foretelling the kingdom of God uh, uh, to come, the fifth kingdom, which is the kingdom of God, uh, of Islam, right? Jesus foretelling it, paving the way for its coming, and then the Prophet Muhammad being the camel rider who does an allusion to the destruction on Babylon, etc., right? That makes a lot of sense. When Babylon was destroyed, when God came from Arabia, and the fifth kingdom when it crushed Babylon and destroyed its idols. Okay, now there's another proof here that Isaiah 21 is alluding to two destructions of Babylon. The first destruction to Cyrus and Darius, but also the second destruction from the Arabs. And we know this because um, verse 9, it says... Babylon has fallen, has fallen, all the images of its gods lie shattered on the ground. Well, the thing is, uh, Cyrus and Darius did not destroy the idols of Babylon. They actually worshipped them. As Sa- the Cyrus cylinder, so uh, written by Cyrus himself, his own testimony, it actually records that Cyrus did not destroy the gods. He actually allowed the worship of the other gods, and he facilitated the worship of these other gods and idol worship 
And he even attributed his um, victory over Babylon to Marduk. And he calls Marduk my lord. And Marduk was the biggest god of Babylon. So he actually says, <laughs> Cyrus actually says, that the Babylonian gods, he worshipped them, and he believed that the Babylonian gods are the ones who allowed him to uh, gain victory over Babylon. Well, if Isaiah 21 is describing only the first destruction of Babylon, which is how uh, Christians read the text, well, it doesn't make any sense, because according to this, the punishment of, on Babylon res results in its idols being shattered. But Cyrus did not shatter the idols. He actually worshipped them. So it's clear, really, that Isaiah is describing two destructions on Babylon, as well as the first destruction, as well as the Arabian destruction, which Habakkuk and Daniel speak about. Because this criteria of the idols of Babylon being shattered was not fulfilled by Cyrus and Darius. And, in fact, the messengers, the messenger of God, Muhammad, he commanded that the idols be shattered, and the companions used to go around destroying idols, including destroying the um, idol, idols of Babylon. Now, when the Muslims came, they destroyed the idols in Babylon. They destroyed those idols. And just think about those areas, right? Iraq, Iran, that's, that's where, uh, you know, the Babylon area. Those all became Muslim lands. And even today, they're Muslims. So those idols were shattered and those people became monotheistic believers. Also, if you remember in Daniel, uh, uh, the kingdom of God was going to come and destroy the other kingdoms, right? And and remember the imagery in Daniel too that those empires, uh, you know, Babylon, Mede, Persia, uh, Greece, Rome, these pagan empires came together to form an idol, and then the kingdom of God came and crushed that idol. The kingdom of God was a rock that crushed that idol. So there's a hint there that the kingdom of God was going to destroy the idols in the other. Uh, empires including Babylon itself so it actually corresponds perfectly here with uh, Isaiah 21 which mentions the idols Babylon shattering we know the kingdom of God is like a stone which comes and shatters the idol of the other empire now there's more <coughs> evidence that uh, uh, Isaiah 21 is describing two destructions on Babylon that is the fact that Revelation 14 8 and Revelation 18 2 uh, use the phrase fallen fallen is Babylon which is in Isaiah 21 9 right here Babylon has fallen has fallen Revelation actually uses it and applies it to Jesus' second coming so they uh, the writer of Revelation also saw that two destructions of Babylon are being recorded in this text in Isaiah 21 the first one which already happened but also another one which he thought was going to happen when Jesus returned and it, uh, it would make sense that the reason the writer of Revelation saw that uh, Isaiah 21 is speaking about a second destruction as well because the donkey rider is mentioned in Isaiah 21 and we know the Messiah is the donkey rider according to Zechariah 9 9 that's a very famous thing even in Hebrew there's a phrase uh, known as the Messiah's donkey. It's such a famous thing that the Messiah is going to come in riding on a donkey. That's It's even a phrase in Hebrew. Okay. Uh, also, we have ancient Jews who saw this as describing two destruction on Babylon. As Rashi points out, Babylon has fallen, yet it has fallen. The reason it's repetitive is Targum Jonathan says it means Babylon has fallen and is also destined to fall. So describing two downfalls, that it's going to be destroyed in the future as well. And uh, Kiel's exposition of the entire Bible also mentions this, that the Targum says it has fallen and also it shall be that Babylon shall fall. So two destructions. So also this uh, also points out that uh, Targum Jonathan says it means Babylon has fallen and she shall also fall in the future. So you have early Jews and Christians who understood from this text that it's describing two destructions of Babylon, and that's why it says fallen, fallen has Babylon with the repetitiveness. And of course, there are many clues that it's being about two destructions in Babylon. For yet clues, it's quite clear, I should say, that it's describing two destructions on Babylon. Also, we have Jewish scholars who admit this as well. So Maimonides, who is the biggest scholar of the Jews according to them, in his epistle to Yemen, he says, Similarly, Isaiah intimated that the coming of the Messiah will occur after the rise of the madman. The madman is who they refer to as the Prophet Muhammad in the verse, a man riding on a donkey and a man riding on a camel and two men riding on horses, Isaiah 21.7. Now the man riding on a donkey is a symbolic reference to the Messiah 
as is evident from another verse which describes him as lowly and riding on a donkey, Zechariah 9.9. He will follow the man riding on the camel, that is the Arab kingdom. Uh, the statement, uh, okay. So then he interprets two men riding on horses as being the Roman Arabian Empire. Anyway, the point we're, of course, looking at is that he also recognized that the donkey rider is the Messiah and the camel rider is the Prophet Muhammad. Now, look, he tries to say, oh, this proves that the Messiah will come after the rise of the Prophet Muhammad. But that's foolish. In the actual text, the donkey rider is before the camel rider, which proves the Messiah comes before the Prophet Muhammad. But Jews have a very hard time with this, which is why they have to play these difficult games to somehow say, oh no, it means the Messiah will come after the Prophet Muhammad. No, it, it doesn't mean that. Uh, also, this Midrash also says it. Uh, I've quoted it here, the reference, and then uh, rabbis translated it here. The Midrash implies that the writers, or etc., so he translates the Midrash here as saying, Rabbi Simeon says, writers, this refers to Babylon, chariot, this refers to media, uh, mead basically, pair, this refers to Greece, riding on a donkey, this refers to Edom, rider, riding a camel, this refers to the kingdom of Ishmael. So this Midrash also could recognize that the rider on the camel is a reference to the kingdom of Ishmael, the prophet well, I'll explain this in a second. Now, you'll see that the um, interpretation here is kind of strained, where, where they're saying riders uh, refers to one thing, chariot refers to something else, pair refers to something, etc. It's kind of a strange interpretation here. It's clearly not correct because of the way they've identified uh, empires to nouns. This doesn't make sense. Why should chariot uh, mean something? Why should pair mean something, etc.? Um, but it is a clear rabbinic admission that the fifth kingdom of Daniel is the kingdom of Ishmael. Why? Because notice, they saw here, the rabbi saw Babylon, Mede, Greece, Edom, and Ishmael. And the kingdoms of Daniel are Babylon, then Mede, then Greece, then Rome, then the kingdom of Islam. Edom, they've said Edom here, but rabbis refer to uh, Rome as Edom. So when he says Edom here, he means Rome. Okay. Also, this uh, Midrash as well mentions it, um, so I've quoted it here, uh, it's an 8th century apocalyptic work as well, um, The Secrets of Rabbi Simon ben uh, Yohai, he began to sit and expound, etc., then he sees, uh, you know, is it not sufficient that the wicked kingdom of Eden has done to us that we should also suffer? the dominion of the kingdom of Ishmael, immediately Metatron, so an angel comes and he says that, uh, do not be afraid, mortal, for the Holy One, blessed be he, is bringing about the kingdom of Ishmael only for the purpose of delivering, delivering you from that wicked one, Edom. He shall raise up over them a prophet in accordance with his will, and he will subdue the land for them. They shall come and restore it with grandeur. Rabbi Simon answered and says, from where is this understood? He said to him, Did not Isaiah the prophet speak thusly, and should he see chariotry of a pair of riders, one rider, one riding on a donkey and one riding on a camel? And then they try and figure out, why is the rider on the donkey the Messiah before the rider on the camel? Because he also recognized the rider on the donkey is the Messiah. Uh, and uh, they come up with some a desperate excuse. So anyway, it's clear that he also interpreted uh, the rider on the camel as Ishmael or the Muhammad. Now, also, remember, this is an 8th century writing, so this actually proves that there were rabbis who were seeing the events of Islamic empire spreading, folding right in front of their eyes, and they clearly saw this was the fulfillment of Isaiah 21. Now, of course, the idea that the camel rider is Ishmael doesn't make a lot of sense because Ishmael had already died, but this is speaking about a future camel rider to come. Also, this camel rider, the Prophet Muhammad, is a, the Arabian prophet that's over and over foretold. So he's the one the Bible is over and over building up to. So that makes a lot more sense than Ishmael, who had already died. Why is he being seen in the future? Also, if it were Ishmael, really, it would just be representing the Arabian kingdom, the Islamic empire. But actually, that doesn't make too much sense because... The two horsemen are Cyrus and Darius, and the donkey rider is the Messiah. So we see that individuals are being highlighted. So why would Ishmael be there, whose only purpose would be to sort of signify the Arabian Empire? It would make a lot more sense that the Prophet Muhammad is meant here because a specific individual is being highlighted, just like Cyrus and Darius and the Messiah were highlighted as the other writers. So Ishmael doesn't make sense. He already died, but this is a future person. Now, it's also obvious here... 
um, that uh, because the Jews corrupted the text, that uh, they, many of them, uh, including Masoretic scribes, etc., recognized that this prophecy was fulfilled with Jesus and the prophet Muhammad and the camel rider was the prophet Muhammad. The fact that they had to corrupt it proves the prophecy. Why else would they corrupt it? They corrupted it because they knew the camel rider was the prophet Muhammad and because it proves that the Messiah has already come. They have a very difficult time with that. So basically Jews and Christians who want to challenge this prophecy, they're going to have to explain to us how can it be only about the first destruction of Babylon, not the second destruction which happened uh, through Islam. When it specifically mentions Babylon's idols being shattered to the ground, well, Cyrus and Darius did not uh, destroy their idols. They actually worshipped Cyrus, actually worshipped them. So explain that to us. Also explain to us then why did the Jewish uh, scribes corrupt the reading if it's not a reference to the Messiah and the Prophet Muhammad. Also, uh, what about the fact that the watchman here is Habakkuk and in Habakkuk 2 he sees the destruction of Babylon and he understands from this that God is coming from the south and he's coming from Paran which is Arabia and the whole world is going to be filled with his glory and he's going to punish many nations militarily. God coming from Arabia, that's what Habakkuk understood. So obviously the camel rider is a reference to the Prophet Muhammad who came from Arabia and, and it's the Islamic Empire which punished the Babylons. Also, they'd be throwing revelation under the bus. Christians would be throwing revelation which applies fallen fallen has Babylon to the Messiah's second coming. And Jews would be throwing a targum under the bus. They'd be throwing uh, Maimonides under the bus. They'd be throwing two Midrash and also their Masoretic scribes that corrupted the text also explains us then who is the rider on the donkey and who is the rider on the camel. We know Cyrus and Darius are the two horsemen, so who are the other two riders? And uh, scripture itself identifies the donkey rider as the Messiah, so what are you going to do about that? Zechariah 9.9, the donkey rider is the Messiah. So explain that 